hello Uncle Kerry and Chat. Look at this from Vail, Colorado. My last night here. I head back to Phoenix tomorrow. So I just thought I'd show you that it just started snowing here about a half hour ago. Isn't that pretty? Wow. Look at that. Amazing. Well, back down to Phoenix tomorrow I go. Bye. Hello, everybody, and welcome into my latest live broadcast. It's Tuesday, the 28th of November, 2023. My name is Kerry Holzman. Thank you guys so much for joining me. I almost forgot what my name was. That's never going to happen. Welcome in, and uh, thank you for joining me today. I've got something a bit unique I wanted to share with you. I thought we had a, an opportunity here to see how to update the BIOS on one of these mini forum, uh, mini PCs. And if you're been following the channel for a while you know the mini pcs do a lot of things uh, a little differently than what we're accustomed to in some cases they're a bit old school and other cases a bit more advanced and so quite often we get sent prototypes for review they're not quite finished yet and sometimes they are they just don't know they the company thinks they're done they send them for review and then they realize oh we forgot something and i think this is what's happened here there doesn't appear to be any way to turn the LED on and off. And another video from the manufacturer does show somebody controlling the LED in the BIOS. And the section in the BIOS that they're in, we don't have. So I emailed the marketing company and I said, um, we don't have this option. And they said, no problem. Here's the BIOS. No instructions, <laughs> which is fine. I don't need them. I wouldn't read them anyway. But they sent me a zip file. And what I've done is I've extracted the contents of the zip file onto an otherwise blank, small-ish flash drive. This is a, an 8 gig cheap flash drive from SanDisk. And I just copied all the files right onto the flash drive with nothing else. And I think that's all you have to do to make them UEFI bootable. I don't think you need to go through the whole boot sector stuff like we did back in the old days uh, if you have a UEFI bootable system. So I believe that's how this works. We're going to find out live together. There's no rehearsal here. Everything is live, unscripted, um, obviously unrehearsed. I only have one of these. So I wish I had two and I could do it off camera, go through the process, know what to expect, and then come on and teach it to you. But we'll, we'll learn it together. We'll go on the discovery together. I like to keep my videos as authentic as possible, and that means figuring out things together. A lot of YouTube channels are not doing their viewers a, a, a good service by eliminating all the mistakes and eliminating all of the waiting that has to be done for things to process where they edit, skip ahead. And so it can give people an unrealistic expectation of what that process can be like. Then when people go to have that experience on their own, only then do they realize they were given a disservice by that YouTube channel by sort of glossing over the, the grittiness of the process. And so I like to keep the grittiness in my videos. Some people don't have the patience for it, and I'm okay with that. There's, most videos are made for people who don't have the patience for it. And most pity people <laughs> won't really benefit much other than entertainment from the, the value of what that video is offering them as far as education. It might give them sort of a gist of what to expect, but in many cases, at least in my experience, what is often shown edited and polished and rehearsed and scripted uh, is nothing at all, at least in my experience, like doing it yourself and going through the process. There's no skipping ahead in real life. There's no rewind button or cut button to undo your mistakes. It's all part of a learning process and learning takes time. People that don't have time, they don't have time to learn. That's fine if you're wealthy and you pay other people to do stuff for you and you like to be dependent on others. I'm a big, big fan of being self-reliant and I'm a big fan of encouraging others to be self-reliant. And that does involve some investment of your time. And the more you invest generally, the better the reward is, generally. So if you can't be bothered 
then you also can't be bothered to get the reward or the reward is of nothing compared to what the rewards are that I receive, which is self-satisfaction, education, experience. So with that being said, uh, hello to everybody joining and thank you for the uh, super chat contributions. Paul O'Brien with two euros contributes in super chat. He says, get a move on. We want more. I'm moving. I'm moving. Ben Laird contributes five pounds. And he says, hello all from a cold Scotland. I wish I was in a cold Scotland right now. We are actually getting winter temperatures here in Phoenix this week. We might see, well, it's going to be cloudy. We might see some rain. With the rain, the temperatures drop. Uh, rain is always welcome here in the desert. As far as I'm concerned, it knocks all the dust out of the air, cleans our air. Um, and, and it brings the temperatures down. And quite frankly, I'd rather be too cold than too hot. It's easy to get warm. It's not so difficult to cool down. Peter Laycock, our good friend Buster, also joins us from Scotland, contributes 10 pounds. He says, good evening, Carrie and Marlena and everyone in the chat. All the best from Bonnie, Scotland. Thank you, Buster. Thank you to each and every one of you joining me today. See a lot of uh, badges, a lot of faces in blue there. Names in blue. And um, that means you've been with me for a while, and I appreciate you. If people come in and they're not blue, they're like, what happened? I just came into a blue convention? Uh, what you've discovered is what all the people in blue discovered years ago, and hopefully you'll see the value in it, want to stick around, and over time, through just exhibiting and being supportive and kind to others, you'll be turned blue. That's all it really takes. And we're always happy to add more like-minded individuals to our amazing community here on the internet where there, uh, there's no bullying allowed. There's no insulting. We're not dealing with that here. That's pretty much everywhere on the internet. This is a safe space, regardless of your age, gender, religion, uh, race. It doesn't matter. Just don't be a jerk and you're welcome to be here. Now, um, I also, I got a, something in the mail I wanted to mention. Some of you who've been watching the channel for a while know that I have a yeah, a modest little coin collection. I collect currencies from around the world, some of which aren't even used anymore, like the French franc. I just think it's kind of cool. And when my father would travel to other countries, uh, he would bring me back currency because he'd ask me if I'd want a T-shirt or something. Uh, T-shirts wear out, you know? Give me something I can have tangible. I can stick at a drawer somewhere and look back from time to time and remember where that came from or what have you. And... Uh, this was sent, I guess, back in October, but I only recently was over at Studio A to get the mail, so the mail had been stacking up over there. And this comes from Mike Gregory, and Mike says, This is for your service to us campers who watch your videos but don't participate. Much thanks and continue making videos. Also, I am a United States Navy docs veteran. Thank you again for your service to the computer community. Your faithful watcher, Michael Gregory. And uh, check out what Michael sent. This is a 2011 Medal of Honor commemorative coin from the United States Mint. These are usually like 99 point something percent pure silver. It's typically an ounce of silver, which is, I don't know, they're worth about $17 or something, but... Um, I'm not interested in the value of it. I'm interested in just the collection of it. And it's cool that it's, this honors the, um, those in service here in the military. So I'm going to bring it up to the camera and show it to you. So here is the front of it. Focus. And here is the back of it. Let's go this way. I keep wanting to go to that edge. I suppose it's supposed to go. I have it upside down. There we go. That's almost right uh, this way. I'll never get used to everything being backwards in the camera, as you can tell. Anyway, it's really neat. It's very thoughtful. Very thoughtful gift, and this will go with my collection of other 
coins. I have a lot of silver dollars and I have, as I mentioned, currencies from around the world. And again, it's not, it's not an investment for me. It's just, uh, I don't know, just something kind of fun and neat. And uh, that was really cool. So thank you for that. Also, congrats to our veteran giveaway PC recipients. Uh, we sent three of those out. I think there's one more to ship. And I've got a couple of, um, I think they're HP Elite Desk 800 G2s that still have the DisplayPort module. And I'm curious if I can acquire an HDMI module and swap it out. So um, whether or not we get to that today or this week, it might be fun to gonna go on that journey together. I'm not quite sure if they make them for that model or not. Otherwise, if you have HDMI, you'll need to get a DisplayPort to HDMI adapter. I usually get these little cables off Amazon for about 10 bucks. Plugs into an HDMI port on one end, and then you just use your regular HDMI cable you have now uh, from your monitor, plug it right into here. And then uh, you're good to go. It's really easy. It carries over the audio and everything. There's no, there's no uh, degradation of audio signal or capability of the HDMI port by going through the DisplayPort adapter. It's uh, transparent, it's easy, it's inexpensive. Ideally, if I can get the port, I'd rather do that. But uh, I seem to recall looking for it, it didn't exist for that model of HP. But I think I need to look with fresh eyes. Um, let's see, oh, I wanna shout out a thank you to our good friend Frankie B, who gave a very generous Amazon gift card uh, on Friday show. And I didn't get the shout out in time. So thank you to our good friend Frankie B for his continued support and generosity. Also to our good friend Buster, who contributed earlier for his continued generosity and support. So we can continue to stay free of corporate control. I saw a video the other day, which I thought was pretty good on a channel called Lawn TV, L-O-N TV. And he was discussing the problem with paid reviews. It can't be a review if it's paid. That's a commercial. I agree with him 100%. If you're going to do a review, you've got to have full disclosure if you're getting paid for it, or even if the product was sent for free, like Minisform sends me the product for free. But beyond that, I can say what I want. I can air the video when I want. I don't have to give them the video. I don't have to get their permission to air the video. Sometimes companies will reach out to YouTube content creators and they'll say, hey, would you like to review our product? And say, sure. And they say, okay, well, here are the guidelines you have to follow. Right there, as soon as they mention any rules, it's no longer a review. Now you're making a paid advertisement. They like to play with the words. If you want to learn more about this process and see some of the actual requirements that were sent from a from real companies to real content creators asking for reviews, I think you'll be shocked. L-O-N-T-V is the name of the channel and just search the videos for, I think it's about reviews, something in the title about reviews. And it can be very eye-opening if you're not a creator and you don't understand, don't fully grasp what's happening behind the scenes and how some of these content creators are able to afford some of this content might be shocked to learn that the content creators in many cases have no control over the content. They're told what to make, how to make it, when to publish it, or they don't get paid. So uh, with your contributions, with your support, with your memberships, I don't have to go down that road. In fact, I, I think I would rather not make videos than go down that road, quite frankly. Um, if there was a product I really liked, and there are products I really like, I could see doing a, a piece on it, where, which is very positive because it would be because I like it and getting paid. Right? Nothing wrong with that. And certainly getting paid does sort of question the integrity of the reviewer, right? You can't be really sure. If, did he really mean what he said? Or did he only say that because there was money involved? So in much the same way, when I get a product for free, I'm not that upset if it doesn't live up to my expectations. I can assure you if I paid with channel money for something and it didn't live up to the 
advertising the claim that the uh, manufacturer was making, I would be pissed off. I would feel like, how dare you try and rip me off, you know, and I would send it back and get a refund. Clearly, by getting the product for free, I'm not as upset if the product doesn't live up to my expectations or it falls short in some ways. It's easy to forgive those things. So it does, in a way, affect the review. The only thing I can really tell you to reassure you is that the companies that I'm reviewing in general, I'm a big fan of. I'm a fan of B-Link and Minis Forum. I'm a fan of uh, what I've seen from Peladin and what I've seen from uh, Geek, Geekom. Uh, there's plenty of companies I really like, and then there's a few I don't really know, so we'll take their product and we can evaluate them together. And there's a few I warn you against. So even getting the product for free, if the product is bad, I will still warn you against it, and I will still be upset that they tried to pull a fast one like, uh, like those mini PCs that say they've got Windows 11 on them, and they do, but they don't actually have a TPM. So they circumvented all the Microsoft security policies. It's deceptive. So did they lie by saying it had Windows 11? It came with Windows 11. They didn't lie. But it should never have been able to have Windows 11, except that they circumvented all the protection that prevents Windows 11 from being put on to uh, computers that aren't compatible. They, they weren't disclosing that on the, uh, at least on this page, it was a new egg page that detailed the specifications. So if you're buying a really inexpensive computer, you should verify that the CPU it has is Windows 11 compatible. At the very least, do that. Because if that CPU is, uh, is several years old, and how would you know, right? If you're not into this stuff like some of us are, it may be that the computer is super inexpensive because it's old inventory and they want to get rid of it before it's completely worthless. And it may have originally had Windows 10 on it, but nobody, when I say nobody, I mean it, the product won't move as well. It gets the, the consumer that's shopping online, going through the web pages. In general, we'll see Windows 10 being old, Windows 11 being new. So by putting, forcing Windows 11 on an older machine, they can trick the consumer into buying something they think is a good deal when in fact, they're just trying to uh, offload their old inventory and make you think you're getting a deal at it. When companies do that, even if they send us the product for free, I call them out on it. I don't give them a break because the product is free and I warn you not to buy it. And I certainly question the ethics of any product that company makes. And I think it's something that needs attention drawn to it. So we raise awareness so we become smarter consumers. We're not just throwing money at something that looks like a good deal. We know if it's a good deal. All right, let me take a look here in the chat before we get started here and uh, hope everybody's doing well. Josh Preston says, thank you to all the U.S. veterans for your service. Yes, absolutely. Planet Cryos with a $5 super chat says he can't stay. He just dropped in to say I'm here with you in spirit for this stream. Right on. Well, thank you, Planet Cryos. And be sure and check out Planet Cryos' videos over on his channel. He makes excellent videos that look very expensive to make, at least uh, the parts he's using. Be sure and check him out. Give him a like. Throw him a subscribe. He's a member of our community, and he's a great guy. Peter Laycock says it just started to snow in Edinburgh. Oh, I bet that's beautiful. You need to take a picture of that, Buster, and send it to me. I'd love to see it. Of course, we started the video off with our good friend Mitch Morrison out there visiting family in Colorado, and it started to snow. And, you know, being from Phoenix, we don't... I got like a hair on my nose. I'm sorry, I don't... <laughs> I don't want to rub my nose on camera. It's itchy. All right. Let me just mention that elephant in the room and get it out of the way. Uh, hopefully I just took care of it. The, uh, our friend Mitch was in Colorado visiting family over the holidays and being in Phoenix, we don't see snow like that. We have to go up north to Flagstaff or something. So it was really cool to see the snow and I appreciate that he took the time to uh, 
make a video. And besides, he wanted to try his new iPhone 15 out to see if it was uh, what the picture quality was like. And I have to say, looks good. Looks real good. David Moore contributes 10 pounds in Super Chat. He says, here is my late fee. Thank you, David. I appreciate you, my friend. All right. Now, uh, let's get this hooked up. And let me show you what the problem is. And then we're going to try and do the BIOS update. And then we'll look and see if the problem is resolved. I mean, that's pretty straightforward, right? Ray Cut says, hi, Carrie. Nice to see you again. Hey, Ray, thanks for joining us. There's my friend Ron Hillier hanging out with us in the chat. Feral Terminator says, when is your birthday? I'd like to gift coins 100 years older than the giftee. You're going to have to wait till summer. I just had a birthday and I'm in no hurry <laughs> to have another one. But the end of June. All right, let's see. Um, I'm looking for the power adapter. It should be in here somewhere. You'll know when it's my birthday because we usually do something, some kind of special build or I don't know. I try and... You know, I'm, I'm not somebody who, who likes to be around a lot of people in real life. I can tolerate it for a certain amount of time, and then I just feel boxed in and uncomfortable and sort of a wallflower and just want to sneak out. So being able to do stuff like this online and have friends join me from all over the world, virtual friends from all over the world, is a way better birthday party for somebody like me, where there's no awkward silences or pressure from anybody to interact uh, i'll never forget being in junior high and there was a dance and all the boys were against the wall on one side and all the girls were against the wall on the other side and everybody was afraid to ask anybody to dance they were afraid of rejection they were afraid that they weren't good enough but, you know that's typical and to be expected and chaperones didn't really help much by saying you must you must go ask a girl today you must it's like saying, you must go and get yourself rejected. <laughs> that sort of takes the fun out of it, you know, unless the girl says yes, and she'll dance with you, in which case, all right, you know. But uh, the, the, I would much rather do that online. <laughs> I guess that's what I'm trying to say, that I don't have to deal with that anxiety. Now, I don't have that problem anymore, but it was paralyzing as a teenager and i know i wasn't alone in that feeling because of all the other teenagers i saw also being inactive and scared they're scared nobody wants to be rejected so what i like about our community here is nobody is rejected everybody is welcome unless you're a jerk now, if you're a jerk, that's a different story, right? One of those teenagers walks up to a girl and says, you're going to dance with me or what? And it deserves to get rejected. So when I say that, I'm assuming modesty. All right. Does that bring back memories for some of you? We've all been there, man. We've all been there. All right, let me grab a power cable here. We're going to use the Mickey Mouse power cable and plug it in there. And then power adapter in over here. HDMI cable in right here. Ethernet cable right there. We've got two Ethernet ports on this bad boy. This is a fast little computer. It's got a magnetized lid on it just as a uh recollection for those of you who get confused like i do with how many computers i review here like which one was this again it's got the logo my logo the channel logo here printed on the lid that's uh transparent and then this whole white square lights up as rgb and the problem is i had oh and this is magnetic these metal bars are magnets here and here and they are strong magnets all i got to do is get it close and it grabs it and pulls it from me. So that ain't going nowhere. And then behind that LED screen, 
that's where all the RAM and storage is. So there's four screws around the corners and take that out. And that's how easy it is to get to. So with all of that hooked up, I guess just a keyboard and a mouse is all I'm missing. I will add a little dongle here. And then I'm going to, we'll go to the HDMI input and I'll put this camera in a corner here, like so. And then just a little housekeeping here on OBS I want to take care of so I don't get any surprise videos playing in the middle of something here. Let's go ahead and turn this on. Make sure that I've turned on, put in the mouse. You'll see that the logo lights up, and in just a minute, we'll get the power on self-test screen. And I think I hit delete or F2. I can't remember what it is to get into the box. But we should find out here in just a moment. Here we go. I'm hitting delete and F2. Okay. Uh, one of those worked. So just so you can see the whole BIOS, since we now have a video, input, I will go ahead and turn off camera one so we can see the whole thing here. And I'll explain to you, as I understand it, um, we're supposed to have an RGB option, go full screen so I can, there we go. Okay, so you see we've got a setup screen, a boot screen, UEFI shell, um, the BBS menu, and boot options are here. I want to go over to setup, click once on that, just one click. And you'll see we've got optimized defaults, previous values, all the stuff here on the right side. Under advanced and under onboard devices, we're supposed to have something right here at the bottom that says um, it's basically RGB control. And it's not here. And so this is one of the examples of getting a prototype or an early model for review prior to it being really ready for the public. That's why sometimes you know people reach out and they're like, hey, could what are, what are you planning to do with that review unit? I have to hold on to it. It would be very bad <laughs> for the review units to get into the hands of consumers and then have those consumers contact support. First thing support's gonna wanna know is what's your serial number. And then once you tell them a serial number, they're gonna say that serial number doesn't exist. Those serial numbers are taken out of the system and given to the marketing company because they're review units. They don't want to spend any money supporting them. Right? They've already given the unit away. They don't want to go bankrupt than having to support the unit they gave away. So they're exchanging the units for reviews is effectively what it comes down to, which is brand awareness and marketing and search results, which is a pretty good deal for everybody, I think. It works for them. It works for me. It works for the viewers. But the review units in and of themselves, um, they stay here and they will be used for projects. Uh, otherwise, I could loan one to somebody locally if they wanted to sort of tell me what it's like to live with it, but I need it back. So it's just like a loan. In the meantime, just want people to understand that when we buy things using the money that people contribute, and we go to Amazon and we buy things, those are things that can be potentially given away depending on their value. All right, so here at on the advanced section, we should have five options. We only have four. And when we look under the main section, we'll notice our BIOS version is 1.00 and our uh, EC version is 0 0.06. And we've got a date of October 10th of 2023. So let's keep that in mind because when we update, we want to see these numbers change. I don't know, I can't remember which BIOS version they sent me. I just know it's supposed to be the latest. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to camera one here momentarily. Camera one. In fact, let's go full screen on camera one. And all I've done is I've taken the zip file and I've extracted it to this otherwise blank flash drive. A lot of times you're gonna want these formatted in FAT32 Sometimes NTFS doesn't work. I'm not exactly sure with UEFI 
I like to keep it simple. I don't want to find out if the advanced formats are going to be recognized by this BIOS versus that BIOS. So I don't want to worry about that. If I keep it as FAT32, it should be universal across all systems except for the oldest systems, in which case you might need just FAT or FAT16. But we're talking systems that are 20 plus years old. So if you get a flash drive that's too big, you may not be able to format it in FAT32. Just saying. Uh, XFAT may or may not work as well. So because this is a brand new latest and greatest machine, it may not matter. This could be just PTSD from past experiences. So I can't remember how I formatted this, but I think it's FAT32. I'm not going to worry about what its format is unless it doesn't work. So let me uh, plug this in right here. And then we want to go to the boot menu and boot from that, or at least we want to try and see if it's bootable. So let me go back over to the HDMI input. There we go. And I have to go full screen over here on my side. And right here it says boot. Buy it boot. Boot option one, boot option two. There should be a boot override. Hmm. So if I hit escape, but without saving us. Oh, that takes us back to boot. All right, so under boot, you can barely read that. Boot options doesn't offer us anything other than let's hit escape. Okay, we're back to boot. Let's just try boot. Well, I guess boot is just essentially reset. Ah, well, that's good to know. And um, we're going to find out why this thing isn't bootable. So let's go to, let's do it this way. We can go to settings. And then under Windows Update. And then under Advanced Options. Recovery. Reset this PC. So before I do that, I just want to take a look at this flash drive. I want to make sure I didn't grab the wrong flash drive. Yeah, so these are all the files that were in the zip file, and all I've done is extract them. But what format did I put this drive in? It's whatever the default is from SanDisk, I'm sure. At 32, which is what I thought it would be. Okay, so all that looks good. I think this should be... Bootable. So if we do advanced startup, restart now. You'll notice there was no um, BIOS update option in the BIOS like you would see on a, on a regular motherboard. And you often won't find those on laptop BIOSes either. These little mini PCs have more in common with laptops than they do with desktops. Use a device. UEFI USB partition one. That sounds right. It's USB. See what happens. And hopefully it's got an auto exec bat file. It just runs automatic. Or some kind of auto run file. Might be letting my age show. No, that did not work. Take one more look at it. <clears throat> Sometimes you have to make a flash drive bootable. But I thought with UEFI, as long as it had the files it needed, it would OK. I wonder if we can just run this through Windows. Hmm, maybe we can try that and see what happens. If we copy these files and put them just in a temporary folder here. 
folder. Paste. I only ask that because I see some files that end in 64, which implies 64 bit, which means it would be running within Windows. So let me take a look at the extensions on these files and see what we have here. You can usually tell simply by the icon if it's an executable file or not. Like there's WinFlash. Um, let's take a look at. Uh, Or did they move my show file extensions that used to be right up here at the top? They've moved it again. Darn you, Microsoft. Show file name extensions. Jeez, it used to just be one click. Now I got to like, do two or three clicks. Jamie McGregor has been a member now for 18 months. He says, run the WinFlash batch file on the USB. It should kick off the firmware update. Where is WinFlash batch? So the problem is my screen is super, super tiny. Oh, right here. Let's see if we can run it as an administrator, just to be safe. Right click. Show more option. Run as administrator. I'm so glad they made me have to double click instead of single click. That does appear to be doing the trick. Thank you, Jamie McGregor. Jamie just sent me his latest investment of a $500 ear ying motherboard. <laughs> Don't know what he's. He seems very happy with them though, and I will live vicariously through his experiences. I wouldn't spend that kind of money for those ear ying boards. They're just made with everybody else's trash. This is a very old school uh, way to flash a BIOS. You can flash a BIOS these days like one of three or four different ways. And um, Sometimes even some of the newest BIOSes can still be flashed in the old school way if you were into that sort of masochism. So we'll sit here and see how long this takes. This is all being done in real time. And hopefully we don't have a power outage during this process, but we never have before. Greg M says ThinkPad start flashing the BIOS within Windows and then reboot to DOS. Yeah, I've seen that with, um, with my Intel Nooks as well. But what's nice about them is they'll get the BIOS update automatically through the Intel driver update assistant, which is very, very cool. Jerry McFarland says, what would you do if the power did go out during a BIOS flash? I would fix it. Sometimes the BIOSes are recoverable. Um, depends on, there's a number of variables that can occur. My biggest concern about a power outage while equipment is on isn't whether or not I'm updating the BIOS. It's whether or not there was a power spike that caused any damage to the power supply or circuitry of the equipment itself. When it comes to BIOS recoveries, you know, if it was all the way at the end of flashing the BIOS and it was just in a verification stage, no harm, no foul. Uh, other times, if it was just starting, it may not have, um, you know, in some BIOSes, they erase the previous BIOS first. Um, but there are usually recovery techniques. But essentially, I would reach out to the company, you know, aside from just doing the basic steps. I would reach out in this case to Minis Forum and I would explain the scenario and I would ask them to advise me on how to proceed. And that's how I would recommend you work with any 
type of scenario with any equipment that's under warranty. You should not have to pay somebody to fix it, nor should you have to figure out how to fix it when you're under warranty. You just need to be patient, reach out to the company, even if it's through email, explain the scenario, and patiently wait for a response. Basically, you're asking for advice on how to move forward. And they'll tell you exactly if you need to send it back and what the process is, or if there's a key combination you can press to try BIOS recovery, which there is on like, you know, many like HP and Dell laptops, for example. There may be that such thing here on this uh, mini PC. Now, I will say that if I was somebody that dealt with a lot of power outages on a regular basis, I would do this with a uninterruptible power supply plugged in, a UPS. But we've been here in Studio B now for three years, and we have never experienced a power outage in three years, not once. So it's not as though we live in an area where that's common. The odds of a power outage happening well, I'm doing a BIOS update. <laughs> you know, you got to think about how unlikely that is because I don't do BIOS updates that often. And when I do them, they only take a couple minutes. So we're only vulnerable for a couple minutes, a few times, maybe twice a month or something. And again, if I was concerned or paranoid without justification, in other words, if I just had my mind fixated with the anxiety of a potential power loss without any history or precedent, then I would just waste my money on a UPS if it made me psychologically feel better. But I go off of you know the information that each scenario presents and then I adjust my actions accordingly because I'm not a robot and I can experience you know judgment and I can make that assertion. So either way, it'll be fine. So right now we're doing our first reboot. That's why it says no signal. Now, don't freak out or panic if it doesn't come right up. It may take a minute or two while it continues to process. Uh, not only does it have the new BIOS to verify, but then it has to retrain the RAM and CPU. So now <laughs> it looks like it's restarting a second time, still normal. Um, this could happen three, four times. Leave it alone, hands off. This whole process is a hands off process and it should boot us right back into Windows. Now, we're not going to see any difference in Windows. This BIOS update, as far as I know, didn't do anything that we can tell from within Windows. The BIOS update um, should be adding the RGB control in the BIOS. So now let's go ahead and go back to settings and over to Windows Update, over to Advanced Options and Recovery, and then over to Advanced Startup, Restart Now. And one of the options we can have is to go directly into the UEFI BIOS without having to worry about pressing the right key at the right time. So even though I've already pressed the right key at the right time and I've proven to you I can do it, it's still always a little bit of a gamble. Is it gonna work this time? If I do it this way, it always takes me into the BIOS and it takes that stress out of, you know, having to pay close attention, push the button at the right time, make sure it's the right button. Um, if it's a system I've worked with day in and day out, I'm gonna be very familiar with it. But I've only had the system on the bench once before, so I don't know it very well. So right here under Troubleshoot, Advanced Options, UEFI firmware settings and restart. So when it restarts, it's going to automatically take us back into the BIOS. Now, if you recall what the BIOS version was and what that screen looked like that I had taken you to before, you'll see that the BIOS is now version 1.03. And if we scroll down, we can choose English as our language right here. It has changed the BIOS back to defaults. So if you recall the very first time that I turned this machine on, it was defaulting into the um, what appears to be Chinese language. I, again, I don't know if it's Mandarin or Cantonese or what it is, but I know I can't read it. So we changed that right down here. And it can be difficult. You know, how did you know to do that, Carrie? Well, it's going to be on the main screen. Your language options will always be on the main screen. And there will always be sort of a drop down box or selector. 
And since that's the only one we have on this whole main screen, it's not rocket science to figure out which one it was, regardless of what language it was written in originally. Now, if I go back over to advanced, was it advanced? Yes, an onboard settings, right? Look here. Remember before we had five options. Now we have RGB LED, enable or disable. That's what I was missing. And this is what I saw on the uh, Minis Forum. Minis Forum's got a YouTube channel. And unfortunately, they don't have, apparently have a capture card, so they just film the screen with a, with a camera. And it doesn't look very good. It's difficult to read. It's a bit on an angle. There's some glare. There's some flicker. So you guys get to see it nice and clear, and maybe Minis Forum will want to take this video and you know, either air it as is or edit it to how they want it to be. They can even put their own voiceover on it if they want to. They've been very kind to me, so I'm very happy to share my content with them on their YouTube channel. Now, the RGB LED option is just an on and off. We can't really control the color. It's either going to, and I, and I think there should be a software update. Would expect one where you can pick the color you want and choose what color pattern you want to have. That may even be built into Windows 11. Now that I'm thinking about it, I think there's some built-in RGB controls, which I haven't tried, but I really wanted this. So I'm glad to see we've got that. And once again, we are now version 1.03 with the EC version of 0 0.07 with a build date that's a month later, right? The other one was October 10th. This is November 10th. And uh, the EC version is just 0.1. There wasn't a big update there. BIOS version is significant, gone up essentially three versions. We went from zero to one to two to three. And traditionally with BIOSes, you always get the latest one. You don't do the intermediary BIOSes. Now, uh, unless it says otherwise, right? Unless you're instructed otherwise, it's not normal. Um, let me go back to camera one again. Here we are. And let's see what you guys have to say about this process. And thank you again to uh, Jamie McGregor for the tip. Appreciate you, my friend. John Williams says, good afternoon to you and everyone in the chat room. It's a very cold 23 degrees Fahrenheit here. Where's John? Is he in uh, Wisconsin? Ben Laird said, one of my ASUS boards has internet BIOS update. Never works. <laughs> Always says the BIOS is up to date when it's not. Yeah, they've proven for me anyway to be flaky. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. If I do it my way, I know it's always going to work every time. So I'd rather do it my way than... I mean, I guess if I have nothing else to do and I'm like, oh, I wonder if this will work today. I will also, and I recommend you all do the same, I will also check my router for firmware updates. So I have a router app on my phone. And remember, I have two internets here in Studio B, and I will check each router. And well, the TP-Link Wi-Fi 7 router appears to be updating itself, because every time I check it, it's always up to date, and I think the version is changing on its own. The other TP-Link is a mesh system, and that has had a number of updates. And it's a little more complex to update a mesh system because each of the little towers has to be updated. So it takes a little longer. It still does everything on its own. Once you instruct it and give it permission, it's like, okay, your internet's gonna go away for a couple minutes. And then you need to be patient and wait. Don't unplug anything. Don't mess with it. Don't try and go online. You're just gonna get frustrated and confuse the poor thing. So just. Let it take its time and make sure that it gets all of those little mesh points updated with the latest firmware. You want them all to be the same, and it will do it all on its own without you messing about with it. It just takes a little bit longer than a regular firmware update on a router. But I would check my router for a firmware update, regardless of who makes it, and regardless of the last time I checked. Uh, I think that's a very good habit to get into, along with checking your computer for Windows updates, and also just running disk cleanup. 
you can free up a lot of space on your computer. Everybody watching, I've shown this before, it's completely safe. You could do this on a brand new computer that you just brought home from the store and chances are it's got a ton of junk files the manufacturer never cleans up. You can get your computer back from a repair facility and chances are they don't clean up their messes either. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure why. I think it's ignorance. I think they just don't know. But if you're ever looking to do a little maintenance on your computer and try and free up a little space and, you know, hopefully get the thing a little faster, especially if you're running a solid state drive, free space can make a difference in your performance. If we go back over to this computer here, back here, and what do they say in the chat? Someone wanted me to set up the optimized defaults. That couldn't hurt. Optimized defaults, good idea. Anytime you update a motherboard BIOS, you never know what's getting reset. So we'll go ahead and save and exit. Save and exit here. That'll save the changes. And when we go back into Windows, I'll show you this little tip to clean things up and it's safe. You're not gonna hurt anything. Also, because this is live and filmed in real time, you're gonna get the actual boot time, the uh, UM780 XTX machine, which is it's really fast, it's really quiet. I'm very impressed with the machine and putting my logo on it certainly, certainly wins me over for sure. All right, let me just say uh, continue to get rid of this, skip, back, skip. All right, so it won't bother with us with that anymore. <clears throat> so I've left the RGB on, by the way. We haven't tested that, but I'm sure if I flip it to disable, the RGB will go off. I'm sure it will. And again, if you want me to test it, I will. But what I wanted to show you first was... If you go down to your search menu, and this is true for Windows 10 or Windows 11, type in storage, S-T-O-R-A. You really don't need to go any further than that. If you want to continue typing, feel free. But what comes up is a suggestion, which assumes you're going to finish typing storage settings, which is what I would have you do. Click on that one time. You're going to bring up storage sense. And right here where you're going to see the toggle on off, make sure you turn it on if it's not already. Click once on it, even if you've already got it configured. Now, I usually set this to run every month. The default is to only run when you run into low disk space. But I think you've waited too long, in my opinion, if you're waiting until there's a problem. So I want to avoid the problem. So I run it once a month. Uh, you can disable, to delete files in the recycle bin, you can change this. I think it's been in the recycle bin 30 days, and it hasn't already been removed. Let's go ahead and remove it. And then you can also delete files that you've downloaded in your downloads folder if they've been there for a certain period of time that you specify. This one, I say never. And even if all of this is already set this way, then all you have to do is click run storage sense now and that forces that cleanup so even though it may be running on the first or whenever you have it running i like to know exactly the last time i ran it and so that you can see how fast that was but here's the thing it's not that thorough so once i've done running storage sense on windows 10 or windows 11 i come down to the search box one more time and i type in disk D-I-S-K, and then cleanup, which I don't have to finish typing because it already makes that suggestion. A single click is all it takes. And then click on this button that says clean up system files. And then it's going to present you with a number of checkboxes. And I go through every checkbox and select it. Now, I've already been in here and done this. Otherwise, there would be some boxes unchecked. The fact that all the boxes are checked is evidence that I've been in here. <laughs> That's why Carrie was here. And you can see it's not gonna free up much space because I just did this recently. Some of you watching will free up literally gigs of hard drive space that is nothing but junk files that will cause no harm to your computer. It won't cause any programs to stop running. You won't lose any data. It's completely as safe as safe can be. And all you have to do is click okay. Click delete files, 
And this could take a while, depending on if you've ever done it before, depending on whether or not you've got a mechanical drive or a solid state drive, how full it is, and how many files it's deleting. So this could take 30 seconds. This could take 20 minutes. When the box disappears, you know, you don't get an OK or any sort of confirmation. It just disappears. There's one final step, and that is to restart the computer. And sometimes, sometimes when you restart the computer, there are files it could not delete while Windows was running. And it'll say installing updates. That's sort of a generic term that it's running a process while the Windows restart takes place. And I see that quite often after a Windows disk cleanup that I've just run. So if you see updates are underway or that sort of thing, don't freak out. That's just the rest of the disk cleanup finishing when it started. And then when we come back up to the desktop now, I am confident I have freed up a bunch of space safely. I'm not going into the registry. I'm not using any third party utilities. It's not costing me any money. I'm not dealing with any adware or shareware. This is all built into Windows. Now, if you want to take that a step further, you can bring up uh, a free application from Microsoft called PC Manager. So if I just go up here and type in uh, Microsoft PC Manager, this is really clever. It's a, Microsoft says it's a beta, but there's not a whole lot to it. It's effectively one interface that connects all of the system utilities together that are what I would consider preventive maintenance utilities. Not all utilities, because that would be ridiculous. So if I scroll down here, uh, let's see, I'm looking for an official Microsoft link, pcmanager.microsoft.com, that's real. We'll click on that, and then I'm gonna go to download. I suppose I could have clicked on this download. Either way, you're going to get the same thing. And it's a pretty small application. I don't know why it hasn't started. Let me refresh. This will work with Windows 10 and Windows 11, in case you were wondering. Everything I'm telling you about right now is sort of a universal process I go through when I'm working on client computers. not good. Oh, it looks like we've lost our internet connection right down here. I got the globe. Let me, um, let me reseat my ethernet cable. I suppose I can unplug this flash drive and I can erase it because we'll never need that BIOS ever again. Now that we've uh, updated the BIOS. There we go. Now we're back online. So I, don't trust this. I'm going to go here. Click download. That's better. See, manager wants me to get it from the Microsoft Store. Uh, I hate if I have to get it from the Microsoft Store, because sometimes it requires you to have a Microsoft account. <sighs> Let's see if it's going to require the account or it will just let me. I think it's letting me have it. You see, it's a pretty small download. It looks like I did not need to log in. It's already installing it. We just hit open. Now, I'm going to just close everything here except for the Microsoft PC Manager so I don't confuse you with a screen full of information. This is all we need to focus on. Start automatically when I sign into Windows. Yes, I want this to run automatically. I click Start. Use the handy toolbox to access useful Windows tools like Screenshot and more. Not now. I want to boost the system. I just hit boost and watch these numbers for free RAM storage free up very quickly. I can go over to settings, which is down here. Smart boost. Have this automatically smart boost. Anytime my system resources are getting clogged up, just turn that on. And I will also get any 
updates to the utility as they're available. So this is like a newer version at 3.3. I've been running 3.1, I think, on my other system. But you can automatically grab um, new versions if you want to. They still consider this a beta. And there are a number of fun little utilities that are, again, they're all part of Windows. They've always been there, but you may not be aware of them or they're so spread out and disassociated with one another that you may do one and not the other. So this brings them all together in one interface. So this is everything to do with your antivirus, your Windows update, um, default browser settings, et cetera, et cetera. Now, normally I wouldn't even go into this section myself. Over here, we've got deep cleanup. So we can run that and it'll scan in much the way that we did the storage sense and we did the disk cleanup. There's even more temp files. <laughs> and again, we can hit proceed and it just clears those out. Now you've got startup apps, process management, et cetera, et cetera. This is the toolbox here. And again, these are just Windows system utilities. And you can turn on the, the uh, toolbar if you want to leave the toolbar on. I usually just keep this, you know, stuck on the home here. Do the health check. Just whatever it wants to do is fine. It's not going to cause any harm. It shouldn't. You should always have backups just in case anyways. But these sections right here on the main screen, these four squares are the ones that should have your attention. If you want to look at your startup and what your processes are, and then your health check and deep cleanup are there. You don't really need to go into any of these other things unless you're looking to explore. When I close this, it'll stay down in the system tray down here. Uh, let's also check and see if we have the latest version of AMD Adrenaline, which I think I installed. Let's check for updates. Make sure that it comes back up to date. Let me right click, go to taskbar settings. I don't want that AMD Adrenaline icon hidden from me. So I want to make sure to turn that one on. I'll turn on the Microsoft PC Manager icon. I don't, oh, Windows Update status, I want that on. VLC, I don't need that on. Safely remove hardware, I do want that on. Microsoft Teams, I don't even use Microsoft Teams. So that's pretty much what I want to see personally. I don't like any of my icons hidden, and I don't like to have to click to expose the hidden icons to click on the icon to eject the USB flash drive. It's just Windows 11 has added a ton more clicks. It's one click extra here, one click extra there. It drives me crazy because it's inefficient, unnecessary, and I don't recall anybody asking for that. Now, let me go back over to camera one. Everything I've shown you is 100% safe, 100% compatible with Windows 10 and Windows 11, and it's 100% free. If anybody's got any questions or comments, this is the time of the show where it's your turn. And uh, if we don't have anybody with anything to say, then I guess we'll wrap it up early today. So let me take a quick look and see what I've been missing here. Thank you. Oh, that's Jamie McGregor. Thank you again, uh, Jamie. Chat's been pretty quiet. Ron Barnish says he's soon to be a member for 16 months in a couple days. Nice. Thank you, Ron. We're glad to have you here. And John Williams, who said it was cold. Yeah, he's in Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin. Hey, my memory's not that bad. Kinetic Plastic says, greetings from Oklahoma, where it's sunny and 53 degrees Fahrenheit or 11 degrees Celsius here. A lovely late November day. Mike Ellis said, I just received my UM780 XTX mini PC. My BIOS out of the box is 1.03, so it shipped with the right BIOS, and I am in the UK. Hey, Mike, thank you for the update. I anticipate that anybody that ordered these would be getting 1.03. 
as I mentioned, as a reviewer, I would have received a unit that they thought was ready. You know what I mean? And then at some point realized that that part was missing and addressed it before it shipped to the end consumer. I believe, and unless I hear otherwise, I believe no units were sent out with anything less than 1.03, except to reviewers. And that's pretty typical that we get early versions of hardware. So we get to introduce you to it and get you excited and, you know, even encourage you to do a pre-order companies like that. And so sometimes in the push to get it out the door, there's some oversight, nothing major, you know, whether or not I can turn the RGB on or off isn't affecting our performance. It's uh, it's an annoyance <laughs> to not be able to turn it off. But the fact that it's got my logo on it makes it a little less annoying. Uh, let's see. And also, what do you think of the performance on the UM780 XTX? I'm very impressed with it. The performance is high and the noise level is low. Is today Patch Tuesday? So Patch Tuesday is always the second Tuesday of the month. So we're at the end of November right now. We're far from the second Tuesday. We're on like the fourth Tuesday, fourth or fifth. So when we reach into December, the first Tuesday of December is not Patch Tuesday. Second Tuesday of December will be Patch Tuesday. And all the other Tuesdays in December are not patch days. Now, sometimes Microsoft has a very important update that they call out of band that they need to release immediately, but that does not supplant or replace patch Tuesday. It's entirely possible that you're getting updates that Microsoft released that were important or that you're getting updates that were postponed for you, such as 23H2 for Windows 11. It's hard to know why some people are getting that offered and other people aren't. And it just kind of feels random to me. But if you're patient, instead of forcing it, it will be offered to you. And it generally will happen on just a normal day of the week. It's not a necessarily a Patch Tuesday update. So when is the second Tuesday of December? What day? Let's see. First Tuesday is the 5th, second Tuesday is the 12th. So the 12th of December will be Patch Tuesday, 2023. It's been that way for a couple of years. And so it's not like you have to guess. It's always the same every month. It's always the second Tuesday until Microsoft changes it. But they've stayed pretty true with the Patch Tuesday rule for about or four years now so you shouldn't have to wonder at this point now how can you not know when to expect it it's been very very consistent Diesel Doctor says hello in the chat. Welcome in, Diesel Doctor. Lou Greeny wants me to check my darn phone. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, it looks like I missed a few messages. Let's see. $25 is sent in from Lou Greeny via PayPal, and he says, this is just a little something for the channel. Sorry, it's not more, but I bought myself a new TV. <laughs> Uh, that's excused. You're, you're excused. Our friend John Jack Wilson sent a very generous PayPal contribution. And uh, he wants me to use this money for shipping costs for the giveaways. That is awesome. Thank you so much, Jack. And uh, I will do that. We're going to do, I think this week we'll do another veteran giveaway and find other people in need. I would like to get some more of these out while they're still, you know, they have some legs. They're uh, 
Windows 10, and Windows 10 is good until the end of 2025. And uh, I just went through and updated 20 of them. 14, 15 of them is what I updated. And you did Windows updates, and they take about an hour a piece to update. New VLC version, et cetera, et cetera. They are good to go. And I'd like to send them out before I have to update them again. Come December 12th, it'll be time for some more updates. And I like to take care of the updates before I send them so that when the recipient receives it, they can immediately plug it in and start using it and worry about that stuff. So thank you to our good friend, John Jack Wilson, who is a veteran himself and is taking care of other veterans. So I will definitely use your contribution for sending out uh, more veteran PCs. And you will see that the giveaway again this week. Well, we'll do it this week. Our friend Buster sends a $200 Amazon gift card. He says, I hope you enjoy this Amazon gift card. Hello, Carrie and Marlena. The temperature in Edinburgh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, which is zero degrees Celsius. Your friend Buster. Well, thank you so much for your continued generosity, Buster. And yeah, I, I, uh, I'm not sure that I'm going to say I'm jealous that I want to be in zero degrees Celsius, but I bet it's beautiful. I bet with the snowfall, you know, before the snow gets dirty and mushy and slushy, it's probably beautiful. Hopefully, I'll, hopefully Buster will take a picture with his phone and maybe a couple send it to us. Just step outside the front door, put your view. I bet it's amazing. Uh, thank you for everybody who has contributed, both in Super Chat, PayPal, Amazon gift cards, and or your memberships. These are the things that keep us independent, not getting me rich, and we're not doing anything excessive, right? But it is keeping us moving forward. I do have a couple more of those uh, ASRock motherboards coming. I think they're such a good deal, $129 for the B760 board. I'm only able to get them at Newegg, and I will show you. Sometimes people are like, which one is he talking about? I've already done a video on these. Uh, in fact, you know what? Well, let's go over to this computer. This thing's a little easier. They go over to this computer here. And let me go full screen. And let's just bring up uh, a browser and we'll go to Newegg. I will type in ASRock. Try to type in ASRock B760 Enter. Now, ASRock makes a number of B760 boards, and the one I'm talking about specifically is the B760 Pro R5 or R5D4. So this one is a B760M. That's a micro ATX board. They might look similar to the naked eye, but this board doesn't have as many slots as this board has. This board is not as long, and this board is for a micro ATX case. This is a full-size ATX board. Now there's also the B760M, again, micro ATX board. That's what the M stands for. That's a slightly different model here that has built-in Wi-Fi. This one does not have built-in Wi-Fi, the one I'm looking at here. And then they've got the HDVM2, which is a, another micro ATX board. And then we've got the regular R5. So if you notice, this R5 is $149.99. It's a full-size ATX. It is not micro ATX, but that's $20 more than this one. Aren't they the same thing? This board here takes DDR5 RAM. So it's going to cost you more for the memory. And uh, on a, an i5 chip, you probably won't notice any performance benefit from having DDR5 RAM. So that's one difference between them. And if I go back and look at the exact same board right here for 129, this one is actually an R5D4. I don't know why Newegg doesn't have the model number correct here, but it does show DDR4 here. The advantage of using the DDR4 
is you might already have that laying around or you might think about upgrading a system that you've got now. There's also no Gen 5 PCIe on here where I think that's the other difference. I think the um, more expensive version has a Gen 5 M.2 slot, not mistaken. I deal with so many motherboards, it's so easy to forget. But well, let's go to storage, chipsets, memory, expansion slots, storage, M.2. So this 32 megabits per, or gigabits per second is a half speed port. It's hyper is Gen 4 and this, oh, so they both are just Gen 4. I stand corrected. If you want to do Gen 5, then you'd need to do um, probably a 790 chipset. So if we look at ASRock and we look and see what they have available, here's the 790 PG Lightning at 159 so $10 more. That's a full-size ATX board. And let's scroll down here under storage. It's here somewhere. Come on now. Okay, I just scrolled right on past it. I was looking for the same specs. This says three Hyper M.2 slots that are Gen 4. That's exactly the same. These Gen 5 capable motherboards generally only give you one Gen 5 M.2, and you can almost always tell when it has it because the heatsink will be pretty big right up here by the um, CPU. So I'm not seeing it here on the PG Lightning. Let me just look at the specs real quick to make sure. Just want to verify. M.2. Gen 4, Gen 4. Gen 4. Gen 4. Okay, so these are all still Gen 4. I guess we're going to have to spend some more money. Let's see. Back to... Happen. We have zero results that match ASRock 790. Not what you said a second ago. Okay. I don't want a micro ATX board. It's probably got to be a 790 board. Here's the Nova Wi Fi at 279. Let's see if this one has Gen 5 on. Specs. Yeah, so this one has one. You see it's 128 gigabits per second. Each one doubles. So that may be your starting price on a base board, plus your, uh, that has Gen 5 M.2 capability, plus the added cost of what an M.2 Gen 5 drive costs. They're very expensive comparatively to Gen 4 or Gen 3. but if you want that sort of performance, you got to pay for it. So it looks like about 280. There may be a cheaper ASRock board out there that's a full size ATX, but I'm just doing a cursory search here just to kind of show you what I look for. And um, I would personally be looking around the 260 price range. In fact, if you go back and we click on that, You'll notice there was three different motherboards listed here. There's the Nova, there's the Riptide. I think the Riptide is the one I did here on the channel. And if I recall, the reason I bought it was because it had that PCIe um, M.2 Gen 5, but I could be remembering this wrong. So let me just quickly look at the specs. I know I built with it. I'm just trying to remember if it had the Gen 5 NVMe or not. So under storage devices, yes, right here. 
All you got to do is look for that 128 gigabit per second mode. And like I say, you'll generally only get one of those. And with a board like this, you likely will get, you know, if you're going to use that, then your video card will run it times eight instead of times 16. So you may need to spend even more money if you want both to run at full speed. You'll need a more expensive motherboard. But you know, that's gaming. Gaming's an expensive luxury. And I don't have any sympathy. If somebody really wants to game that badly and they want that performance, they have more time and money than me or any of my customers have. It's not the world I live in, but all the power to you. All right, let's go back over to camera one. I think I'm done demonstrating that information. And uh, any update to the HP boot issue yet? Nope, still waiting for more suggestions to come in. And I've been very busy with paying customers, but that system is sitting right down here on the floor beneath the camera. For when we have some time, we'll bring that back out. Let's see. James Godert says he loves his UM690. Yeah, that was a good machine. I remember we reviewed that here, and I was very impressed by it. John Williams says, Carrie, that little unit rocks. Thanks for sharing this mini PC with us. Your memory is rock solid. Uh, it doesn't feel like it is, but I appreciate you saying so. Uh, so the other day I was like, what happened to the time zone setting on Windows 11? And it turns out I have two different Windows 11 computers and the time zone setting is in two different places, which I can't quite wrap my head around. I'm not sure why, if maybe one was 23H2. It, it's still in front of me. I'm just not seeing it. But I was like, oh, I had to set my time zone manually because the auto time zone thing that used to be on Windows 10 isn't on Windows 11 anymore. In fact, it is still on Windows 11. They just moved it. <laughs> and they didn't really move it that far. I'm just being blind. But if we go back over to, let's go back over to this machine here real quick. Once I hit the right button and I have to go full screen over here for me. Let's close this down and right click right here on the system date and time. Click adjust date and time, one left mouse click. And I'm like, where's the automatic time zone, right? It used to be like around here, but I see right here, set time zone automatically. Turn that on. For whatever reason, I just didn't see it. Then I have another Windows 11 machine and setting the time zone setting was down here somewhere. So it was driving me crazy because all my computers, remember I said I was going through all of those mini PCs and updating them. They were all off by an hour since daylight saving time took effect. And Phoenix, we don't move our clocks in Arizona. So every one of the clocks was an hour off. And it was driving me crazy. And I'm like, why isn't this adjusting automatically? That's why I leave one of the primary reasons why I leave location settings on. And when I went into Windows 11 and I didn't see it, I'm like, well, that just figures. And I'm in a hurry. I want to get it done. So I just saw the time zone boldly displayed. And I just changed it to Arizona. So when you turn that off, apparently, like, as I recall, the time zone was bigger because it was set to Pacific time. So it's a much bigger text, draws the eye. But if we go over here and turn that on, that option disappears. So that's how you can know, at least on Windows 11, if you've got auto time zone set. What's nice about setting the time zone automatically is if you move the computer around between time zones, you uh, keep adjusting the clock manually. It just takes care of it. You don't have to think about it. Let's do this. Let's go ahead and, um, as you can see, if I go back to camera one here temporarily, the LED is on. Let's reboot. So let me take the uh, camera one and we'll put it in the corner here. Let's go back in the BIOS and we'll just verify that the 
turning off RGB ones. Settings, update, advanced options, recovery, advanced startup, start now. They do add a lot of clicks to do something simple. Now, if you're somebody that does this a lot, you can make a little shortcut on your desktop that you can just do a single click on that will take you through all these steps, just a shortcut. Uh, I don't do it that often to make it worth my time. But if you Google that, you'll find uh, articles that show you what the command is and how to create it. There's also uh, folks like Theo Joe here on YouTube that'll show you tips like that as well. Let's go to Troubleshoot, Advanced Options, and UEFI Firmware Settings, and Restart. So now when it restarts, we're going to go into the UEFI, or into the BIOS. We're going to change the RGB setting to Disabled. And we probably have to save and exit for that to take effect. So let's go to um, Advanced, Onboard Devices. RGB LED disabled. It's off right now. Is it turning off and on on its own? Wow, I wasn't expecting that. It's actually switching it on and off live. Pretty cool. Disabled. And then save and exit. And now when we boot up, you'll see that the machine, you can't even tell it has RGB. It looks like any other mini PC. So if this was in an office environment, during office hours, you turn the RGB off. But then once office hours are over, party time, RGB comes back on. I don't know. Or maybe it's in a bedroom and during the day, you have the RGB on, but at night you want to go to sleep. I think it kind of sucks that you have to go into the BIOS and switch it on and off. We should have some piece of software here that we can flip on and flip off with less technical ability, let's say, going into the BIOS. But um, if we go back over to camera one, full screen, you can see the RGB is fully off. So that does do what it's supposed to do. Now, I am kind of curious if we go to, um, let's go back over. I know Windows 11 has some kind of RGB controls in it, but I haven't really played with them. RGB color model, change lighting and effects. So, ah, this is interesting. Effects, solid color. Well, that's clearly not functioning because it was changing color. It was like in rainbow mode. And I think this RGB is going to stay off because the bio setting, I'm sure, overrides anything we do here in the software. So, hmm. Don't think that's compatible. However, not to say it won't be compatible in the future, but let's restart one more time. Let's turn the RGB back on just so I can try that because I did this in the wrong order, but that's okay. I like the RGB. Again, it's my logo. What's not to like? So I want to leave it on, but I did want to verify that that option in the BIOS now works because that was the whole point for updating the BIOS. Advanced startup, restart now. Troubleshoot. Advanced options, UEFI firmware settings, start.
Mark Gaines contributes 10 pounds. Thank you so much, Mark. Cheers, my friend. Mark joins us all the way from Northern Ireland. All right, we're going to go over here to Advanced, Onboard Devices, RGB. Turn that on. Save and exit. And yep, RGB is back to what it was doing before with the uh, rainbow selection of colors. And in just a minute, we'll be back up to the desktop. Let's go and turn camera one back on and you can see that that's running. And then what I'll do is I'll once again, minimize it here a bit. I need to make it big enough that you guys can see if there's any direct correlation between any changes I'm making and the RGB settings on Windows 11 in this device. I don't believe they're communicating, um, but let me just see what happens here. I'll just type RGB down here. That should bring, yeah, change lighting, colors, brightness. Yep, yep, yep. Use dynamic lighting, yes. Compatible apps, uh, does it matter? Background light control. Brightness. I don't believe this is going to turn the brightness all the way down. Doesn't seem to be having any effect. And it does say breathing, rainbow, wave, wheel, gradient. If you go to wheel, it should spin around. Instead of having the colors cycle, it, the color should sort of spiral. And I'm not saying this have any effect whatsoever wishful thinking, <laughs> but um, apparently not yet compatible with the Minis form. And there usually is a piece of software that you can select a particular RGB color or the pattern of RGB. Clearly the technology can handle it, but for some reason Minis form isn't offering that, or if they are, I'm not aware of it. So that would be sort of one downside that I think is, is very minor. It'd be something very easy for Minis Forum to uh, remedy with a small piece of very easily written piece of software. They're not reinventing the wheel here. Um, let me take a quick look just in case I'm missing something. Because, you know, these videos are live and sometimes I miss things. Uh, let's take a look at all apps. Oh, good. I'm glad that needed a click. And we have AMD stuff. Killer networking card. <clears throat> Nothing that says Minis Forum, which is what I would hope for in the M's. Unless it's in settings. I'll have to do a little research on this and see what other people are saying. There's uh, some great forums where mini, mini PC discussions take place and I will definitely peruse those forums and see what people are talking about. Can't just be me. On it. it would be personalization. So that's dynamic lighting. That's where I was under. I'm sure, we really want dynamic lighting necessarily, but rather direct control of the light. Let me sort this all. It's everywhere. Sorted by. Hmm. Usually I have the computer icon up here. It's part of what the Uncle Carrie's Windows 10 optimizer does. So did I not run the optimizer? Oh, so I need to run the optimizer. I will normally have the computer icon on the desktop, and that's one way I can know if I ran the optimizer. 
Another way to know whether or not I ran my optimizer is to run it again, and it'll tell me, hey, your settings are already to the recommended settings. It's smart enough to look at what your settings are and to determine uh, if the optimizer uh, has already, well, it doesn't know if the optimizer changed your settings, but it does know whether or not the settings the optimizer changes need to be changed or recommended to be changed. So in other words, it won't run twice unless at least one of those options has been set away from the recommend. It's smart enough to just look at the settings, compare them to what it, it wants them to be, or recommends them to be. So if I were to run this again, for example, it looks at the settings. Oh, that's interesting. So there's something here that's not sticking because it should, well, let's hit apply. Oh, I guess I have to hit apply first. It says no optimization is needed. See, I don't, <laughs> I very rarely ever run this twice in a row like that. So I got, I thought that would happen immediately upon running it, but it's after you hit the apply button. Good to know. And then over here, I now have the computer icon that I was looking for. That's from the old XP days. And I just like having it on my desktop much more so than the Windows Explorer. That's just my personal preference. I will generally go up here seven times out of 10 and another few times I'll go down here. But um, you'll see the Windows, uh, the PC manager is automatically running in the background and sitting down on the system tray and will automatically boost our system as needed. It's a free piece of software. And if you don't like it for any reason, you can just uninstall it. There's no risk involved with it. Geo Johnson contributes 10 bucks. Says, hey, Carrie, I've not seen a live stream for a while. Here's my admission fee. Well, thank you, Geo Johnson. Thank you for supporting the channel. Good to see you again, my friend. And uh, I think we can go back to camera one. Are we done? Done with the mini PC, unless there's other questions about it you want me to uh, demonstrate or pull up the device manager, system properties. I know we already did the crystal disk mark test. Pretty sure we did. Some mini PCs do have a button somewhere to control the RGB, to cycle through the different RGB options and colors and turn it off altogether. And I suppose, you know, I, I would much prefer a button personally than any piece of software. They're just more reliable and you don't have to worry about updates. And I suppose I was really shocked to see that this has RGB, but without the button. This may be the only one I've seen like that. If we go back and look at other mini PCs that had RGB, I think they all have a hardware button. In fact, many of the desktops we work on also have a hardware button to cycle through uh, the RGB settings just in case you don't have um, the USB controller or an available USB port. You know, some people use them all up. So that's a weird omission. It's on or it's off and it's rainbow or it's nothing. It's close to being so ideal. And of course, the reason they send these units for review is to get feedback like that. So of course, I will give them feedback. I'll let them know that the BIOS update worked, that the RGB on or off is now available that wasn't there before, that I overall really like the unit. However, the omission of a hardware button or a piece of software to control the RGB level is a bit disappointing and I'd be, be curious if either something does exist and I'm not aware of it or if they're planning on releasing something and what that plan is. Because it's this close for me to have nothing to complain about. <laughs> Al Hedge says, try this, openrgb.org. Openrgb.org. 
Okay, what do we got to lose? Let's go back over to this top here. Open RGB dot ORG. Download. 64 bit. Just want to use File Explorer. So we're going to extract now. There should be a setup in here somewhere. A portable file, it doesn't seem to be an installer. Warning, one or more interfaces failed to initialize. Uh, I'm going to say uh, no worky. I appreciate the suggestion. I guess it was worth a shot. I'm not surprised. Yeah, it doesn't show any devices. Ian Gooch contributes 10 pounds. He says, here's a $10 contribution to your coffers. Regards. Right on. Cheers, Ian. Thank you, my friend. Thank you for supporting the channel. Construction has a question for us. If you go to the system information, then into the software environment, and then Windows error reporting, I'm getting an error on a new PC and old. So errors are common in the sense that some errors are supposed to be there. In other words, there are um, error messages that aren't indicating anything's wrong, but rather that everything is correct. So sometimes the answer it's looking for is a negative answer. Like, do I have a virus? No. The no kind of comes across as a negative response when in fact that's the response you want. Now, I'm not using that as an actual example, but just as uh, an overall example of the concept of a negative error message being a positive thing. If you're not having any problems specifically with the computer, then all you're doing is going in and looking for problems, which I don't encourage that. There's got to be other things you can find to do with your time. If in fact you are having a problem with the computer, something isn't working correctly, then let us know what the issue is and we can do our best to help you. But if what you wanna do is read log files and try and interpret them, I'm not your guy for that. I think those are primarily a big waste of time on the consumer side of things. And that when you're looking into these areas, these are designed for engineers and developers. They're not meant for the home user. And so we get into opening a can of worms when we get somebody who wants that explained to them. It's not that easy to explain. And it can, it can be a six month class teaching you about that stuff. So again, unless you're having a problem with the computer, the computer's not running properly or a piece of software isn't working like it should, myself and our community would, be, would love the chance uh, to help guide you to a solution. But if what you're doing is you're looking at settings and you want somebody to tutor you on what those settings all mean, and that's a very complex thing you're asking. Well, of course, I do encourage questions. I just can't answer all questions, and not all questions are very easily answerable. Some require some background in development and programming to explain quickly, and others require a whole sort of background in um, application logic and processes before you can even begin to go that far down that path. So in any event, uh, I wouldn't go looking for problems. If everything is working like it should, use the computer. Use it for why you have it. Um, if something you're trying to use it for isn't working, we're here to help.
All right. Uh, let's see. Patrick Russo said, is it true ARGB or is it just a light panel? I have no idea. Uh, it could just be a light panel for all I know. I would think that it's cheaper to make it ARGB, but I could be wrong. I think we can, well, let's just restart this just to clear. So that wasn't helping us very much. And let me go back over to full screen on camera one. There we go. John Williams wants to know if I watch any of Doug Betts' live shows. The Big Beast build has been crashing a lot. I generally will uh, put a Doug Betts show on in the background and listen to it. Or sometimes if he's on a subject that I'm not particularly interested in, I'll skip forward past that. I'm not aware of any issues with the Big Beast build that Doug himself hasn't created. And I know that Doug enjoys fixing these problems. So one of the things I learned early on with Doug is when I went to help him, like it seemed to me from my perspective that he was going about something a very difficult way. And then it occurred to me that, you know, after a while I started to get Doug. Doug was doing it Doug's way, and that's the way Doug likes it. <laughs> Doug specifically has not asked me for any help, and there's a reason for that. So the best way I can show respect to Doug is to keep my nose out of it and to let him go about his process the way that Doug does. If and when the time ever comes that he wants assistance, he will ask for it. Of course, I'm always available to help my good friend Doug. But to imply that he needs my help can come across as very insulting. And I wouldn't worry one bit. It's in fully capable hands. I don't think it's anything Doug can't handle. And I think Doug is enjoying it, quite frankly. So, um, oh, I haven't seen it. I don't know what the errors are. I don't know when they started or what potentially Doug changed prior to these error messages or crashing starting. But I suspect he changed something, but I don't know what it was. And I don't know when the problem started. And Doug has not asked me for any help. And I don't want to step in and imply that he needs my help because I don't think he does. Other questions, other comments? Yeah, I'm digging that little mini PC. I like how small it is. I like how quiet it is. Now that I can turn the RGB off, which I will never do with my logo. What other mini PC do I have? It's my logo on it. Essential working too hard said it's Dugway or the highway, LOL. Usually for most technicians, especially those of us who've been in the industry for a couple of decades, we have enough experience under our belt that I, I think sometimes the viewers misunderstand the purpose behind our videos. And I've made this reminder to my viewers a number of times that I make the videos to share my experience with you. And unless I specifically ask you for assistance, you're essentially ruining the experience for me if you tell me how to do it it's it's sort of like um you're playing a video game or you're watching a movie and i've already played the game or i've already seen the movie and i'm telling you what's going to happen next how annoyed would you become and say would you just shut up right i'm trying to enjoy this movie you're ruining it for me would you just shut up and let me figure the game out the way you had that opportunity? Now I want my turn. So leave me alone so I can play the game. If I reach a level where I get frustrated and feel like I can't go on without help, 
I'll ask you for help. But otherwise, I don't think that's ever going to happen. Show me a little respect and courtesy and back off. So when technicians such as myself are focused and we're trying to figure out a problem, that's fun for us. We enjoy that. And if somebody gives us the cheat code and ruins the whole experience, if it seems like we're not grateful, it's not because, oh, I embarrassed him because I had the answer. That's not why at all. You're, you have missed everything from the point of making the suggestion. You missed why you shouldn't have done that. You've missed why that person got upset. It has nothing to do with ego. It has to do with spoiling an opportunity that they were looking forward to. You know, if, if you know what mom and dad got me for my birthday, and it's wrapped up in a present, and as I'm starting to open it, you tell me, oh, they got you a 2XL. That was a little robot in the 70s. You've ruined it, right? You've, you've taken the fun and the surprise, and you've selfishly taken it for yourself when it didn't belong to you, it belonged to me. So if I am filming that because I want to share that experience with you, with my audience, it's not intended for you to guess and tell me what's in there unless that's what I ask on the video. In most cases, I want to share the experience with you and I want you to go on that discovery with me. And I think Doug feels the same way and far be it for me for speaking for Doug, but I imagine most technicians that do what we do really like what we do. And we like the pride, the fulfillment that comes from figuring out all by ourselves without asking for help. You know, it's like not stopping to ask for directions kind of a thing. Um, there's a pride in it, but there's also joy. There's, um, there's a feeling of accomplishment. And I can't put it into words. But to rip that away from somebody without their consent and then to doubly insult them by suggesting the reason they're upset is because you had the answer and they didn't. We didn't see what you went through to get the answer. That's not fair. We don't know that he's not getting the answer faster than you got it because you've already had your experience. Now step aside and let somebody else have theirs. Now, of course, if somebody does ask for help, please do help. But if they're not asking for it, I suppose if you want to help, then ask the person before offering the help, would you like some help? You might be surprised how often you're told no. If you give that person the opportunity to reject that, because otherwise, if you just move forward under the assumption, it creates a, quite often a fight, an argument. You're going to be upset. They're going to be upset. Nobody's happy. And you're like, all I wanted to do is help. And they're like, all I wanted to do was figure this out on my own. You understand? Both people are upset, even though the whole intent of it was to be helpful. If you truly and honestly wanted to be helpful, you would have asked, do you want help? If the answer is yes, then by all means. And if the answer is no, then show a little respect and, and watch. And if you can't watch, if you have impulse control problems, <laughs> turn off the video, come back after it's live. Because disrupting a live broadcast is very frustrating. It's kind of like cooking. A lot of people really enjoy cooking. It's not a chore, something that brings them pleasure, joy, and happiness. And they don't want to be told how to cook what they're cooking. It's part of their expression. It's, it's part of their freedom. It's part of what the kitchen offers. And then if they offer you to try something and then your suggestion is it needs a little of this or it needs a little of that. All well and good because you were asked. On the other hand, if you know how to cook better than the other person, then 
why don't we switch places? You go in the kitchen and cook, and I'll go watch TV. The difference is I'll be leaving you alone. I won't tell you how to do it. So again, for some people, cooking is a chore. For some people, fixing computers is a chore. But if you're lucky, you'll get to do as much as possible in your life things that you enjoy doing and make a career out of it where you get paid essentially to do what you enjoy doing. And I do believe that myself and Doug Betts fall under that category. I don't know what Planet Cryos does for a living, but clearly he enjoys computers. He enjoys making videos. So anybody that gets to do what they enjoy, why would you not want that? We're just about at two hours for today's broadcast, so I think that'll probably wrap it up for today. My thanks again to the folks over at Minis Forum that continue to send us these new prototype models of upcoming mini PCs so we get to be one of the first ones to take a look at them and to look at them in a way that's a bit unusual from other YouTube channels that want to just do benchmarks and measuring. And I really appreciate that Minis Forum gets that difference, right? There's no sense in us doing what everybody else is doing. If you're more interested in the benchmarks on this model, do know that there are other mini PC channels such as ETA Prime and RobTech, to name just two of the more popular ones, that do the traditional benchmarks. Me personally, I'm not so much interested in the technical side as I am interested in the practical side. What does this actually mean for use? What does this equate to in reality? How am I able to use this machine to take advantage of the features that it has? Versus just taking out a measuring tape and giving you all the technical dimensions. A lot of people are hung up on that stuff. And quite frankly, all those dimensions are all available on the manufacturer's website. There's really nothing that these content creators are telling you that isn't already, in most cases, on the spec sheet with regards to the temps and with regards to the frequency, with regards to what's included in the hardware and how the hardware opens up. They even have uh, animated uh, 3D exploded views of the machines that are way better than any content creator. Uh, well, certainly better than I can make by just taking the lid off. The difference is the way that I show you is the way that you're going to do it. The exploded view looks great and it gives you uh, a very comprehensive look at all of the internal components, but not necessarily the details of where the screws and clips and things are. I, I'm finding it very difficult to understand why some reviews exist when the manufacturers already tell you. When somebody says to me, uh, what's the performance of that Wi-Fi router? Well, what do you mean? What's the performance? It's exactly what the manufacturer says it is. If you're using compatible you know, higher end Wi-Fi devices that are in line with the router in an open area without much interference or crosstalk or congestion. Like there's so many variables. So when people say, well, you didn't test the range. I don't need to test the range. The range has already been tested by the manufacturer. And we know that that is the best range you're going to get under ideal circumstances. I don't know what your circumstances are. Are you in an apartment surrounded by other apartments and Wi-Fi signals? Are you in a rural area where there's nobody around for miles? Are you in a house that's, you know, built out of lead? Are you in one of these uh, homes from the uh, 1800s or early 1900s that are very hard to get a Wi-Fi signal through? Because your results are going to uniquely be yours based on what devices are you hooking up via Wi-Fi? How old are they? How many do you have? How many are you using at the same time? What distance are you running? In what environment? Where is the router placed? So I don't know what you're expecting from these reviews that isn't already telling you effectively what the manufacturer says right on the buying page at Amazon says this is the best range. This is the best speed. Anything beyond that 
is not possible. <laughs> this is the best. So you're going to get that at the best. And then depending on all these variables that are uniquely you, your location, environment, devices, that's going to determine what your experience is. And what works great for you may be terrible for somebody else just because of the equipment they're hooking up or the environment that they're in. So to watch a review of somebody just gushing over how great the router is doesn't mean when you get it, you're going to have a similar experience because we don't have control over how congested your environment is, what the materials are that you're surrounded by, and how many devices and the age of those devices that you're hooking up wirelessly. So I, I just don't get it. Now, I do understand if they want to show how certain features work and demonstrate that as sort of a tutorial, not as a review. All the information's already there. So when I do my reviews, I'm trying to offer you information that you can't just read off the product spec sheet, but instead you just want me to read it to you like a bedtime story, I'm not doing that. So in any event, um, that's sort of, in my, my view, the way I see this channel and the purpose of this channel is to provide you with information that's more practical and more reasonable than just hype or just reading specs or running benchmarks that are more or less meaningless for most people. With that, thank you again to everybody who has uh, contributed during today's live stream for both the uh, Super Chat contributions. In fact, let me give a shout out again for those. Thank you again to Ian Gooch, Geo Johnson, Mark Gaines, Jamie McGregor, who renewed his membership, also for that little helpful tip, John Jack Wilson, David Moore, Planet Cryos, our friend Buster, Ben Laird, and Paul O'Brien. Thanks, you guys, for being Super Chat contributors. And then over to the phone, I want to thank again Frankie B and Buster for their contributions, as well as Luke Greenia and John Jack Wilson for the contribution for paying for shipping. That'll cover about four units with what he contribute, contributed. And there was also yesterday a contribution from Davis Parsons for a new egg, sorry, <laughs> for an Amazon gift card. <laughs> I've got a bunch of emails from new egg with their Black Friday specials I'm looking at. It's like, I'm seeing that and I'm reading what's above it. Uh, let's see. I feel like there's one I'm missing here. No, I think I got them all. I hope I got them all. I hope that uh, I have shouted out and given credit to all who have contributed. Because without you, there certainly wouldn't be as many shows. And the subject matter of the shows would be less expensive. And again, a thank you to... Put this piece of paper on the ground here. Mike Gregory for sending that really cool silver dollar in honor of our uh, folks in the service and veterans. That'll wrap it up for me for today. Thank you, of course, to Mara, who contributed the thumbnail for today and set up today's video. And thank you for all of you for watching. <laughs> Mara says, excuse me. Um, Good timing. Jim KJ3N, a member of our community here, has a YouTube channel. Be sure and check out his channel. He says, here's a shameless plug, and he has a link to his YouTube channel. So absolutely be sure and check it out. And... Just taking a quick look here before I say goodbye. Let's see if I've missed anything. Okay. 
Then Laird said, a friend brought me a laptop yesterday. It wouldn't boot. Simple RAM receipt. And it was all good. Hey, he's lucky to have a friend like you that knows how to do that. Oh, I just saw Mats Olof was in the chat room today, joining us from Sweden. Sorry, I just saw you now, Matt Soloff. Always good to see you, my friend. That'll wrap it up for me for today. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all again very, very soon. And until next time, bye for now. And of course, I don't have an outro ready, so just bear with me for a second. I'll find something I can run here. This one seems appropriate.